All right. Welcome back, everybody. How you doing? Once again, it's Mr. Picard's Stay Home, Stay Safe chemistry class. And uh, speaking of safe, what do you think of my new mask? It's uh, got the planets of the solar system on it. It's uh, cloth and washable. A friend of mine made it for me. And um, I am home. Uh, home Alone, as the movie title goes. So I don't really need this right now. And um, I do wear this, and I suggest you do too. Uh, if I go out to a public place, uh, especially any place that might be crowded, um, for your own health and for to help uh, the, protect other people, it's a really good idea to remember to wear a mask in a crowded public space. Uh, you know, and even if you're socially distanced, you know, a reasonable distance away, this helps a lot. But we don't need it right now. And um, this week, uh, we're going to explore the idea of conservation of matter within a chemical reaction. And of course, a chemical reaction is what chemistry is. It's the coming together of matter to form new substances or breaking apart to form new substances and, and how all that happens. And um, it also involves keeping track of everything. And we use things like um, chemical formulas, you know, what's the formula for, you know, for hydrogen or water or zinc or hydrochloric acid, it's a formula. And then the way things react, we put those into equations, you know, this plus this will yield something else. And um, so we're going to look at that as well. And um, I'm going to start with looking at some historical experiments, some classic experiments that really got us uh, thinking about as, as a culture as, and, uh, as, and within science and forwarded our understanding of elements and chemistry and chemical reactions. And a really important moment was way back in the mid 1700s. And there was a scientist named Henry Cavendish and he was studying uh, a reaction that people had done before. People had taken uh, acids like hydrochloric acid, and when they dropped certain metals in, these airs or gases were produced. They called them airs. They, they didn't have a concept of gas as a state of matter. So when things start to bubble, uh, they referred, oh, there must be, this must be some new kind of air which is essentially our definition still of gas. And um, he was very interested in what that gas was. He didn't, wasn't the first one to notice uh, this experiment. And we did this experiment. Um, I'm gonna reproduce it quickly here. But we did this in class, back in our, our classroom, which I miss, and I miss you guys um, teaching you there, but we'll try it here. But if you remember, we did it in a lab called um, properties of elements. And we took elements like zinc, we did take zinc, and, um, and we put them into test tubes, like, just like that. And we wanted to see, because we, we put 11 different elements in, uh, but zinc was one of them, and that's what Cavendish used. And then Cavendish also, uh, like we did, uh, poured hydrochloric acid it, uh, in the same container, and we're using test tubes, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I think you can see, I don't think you can see well, but that's okay, um, that uh, there's immediately some bubbles for me. This is a pretty vigorous production of gas or airs, as Cavendish called them. But like Cavendish, we're going to collect some this time. We're going to collect them in this inverse uh, graduated cylinder and just let the the new airs, the new gas, sort of bubble up to the top. And Cavendish found something out pretty, pretty quickly when he was testing it. He found out that this new gas that he had found, this new air, this new element, caught fire quite easily. In fact, it combusted very readily, unlike my candle. Don't know why. Huh. 
And it was so vigorous, in fact, that uh, he thought he had discovered or might have discovered the element of fire. And that had a name by then. They called it phlogiston, you know. Um, and it, it was theoretical. It was almost mythical. And no one had ever discovered it before. But when Cavendish, like I'll attempt here, uh, put a light to it when it was in open air, he did get an instant um, reaction of combustion. Like that. And um, so he thought maybe, maybe I discovered phlogiston, an element of fire. But something happened. He kept doing more experiments. And he found that there was a bit of mystery to this air, an air of mystery. Okay. And when he found that without the presence of another element recently discovered, another gas, oxygen, I didn't have that name yet, but when he, unless he had those two together, this new gas did not combust, did not, was not flammable. And his inflammable air turned out couldn't possibly be phlogiston because it required the presence of another element in order to be to burst into flame. So this is a big deal. The the entire idea of phlogiston is sort of then put to rest. There there doesn't seem to be an element of fire if it takes two elements to make fire, right? And this is very important. And just now in my little demonstration, uh, you couldn't see it very well, um, it's very small. So I've decided to collect a lot more gas. I think you'll be happy to hear this. And I'm gonna put it, collect it into this very large uh, vessel. Uh, if it looks like a large, heavy fishbowl, you would be correct. It's a big gold fishbowl, but it's very sturdy. And I will collect uh, more of this mysterious gas um, that uh, Henry Cavendish was investigating and we'll see if we can set it alight and observe the combustion um, uh, on the video. Now, as you notice, it also was very quick just now. So I'm gonna film it in slow motion. In fact, I'm gonna film it at 240 frames per second. And then I'm also going to slow down each of those frames into a bit, it'll be a bit choppy, but it'll be about a thousandth, thousand frames a second. And I want you to look at that and see what you can see and then you're going to report back to me.
Hey, good evening. Yeah, uh, it is evening as I uh, uh, film and as I filmed our uh, combustion of hydrogen. I also moved uh, outside of my house uh, to my backyard to make sure I was a little bit safer there. And I did so after sunset, so the darkness I think helped uh, you know, make the uh, video uh, more dramatic and uh, more easily seen. And um, as good observers, you might have noticed uh, kind of this cloud that formed. Not, not after the reaction came to, or nearly came to completion, um, the, the upper part of the bowl filled with this sort of misty uh, pinkish gray cloud. And what we have here is the remnants of that, a uh, substance I think you might recognize, um, this sort of fog. And Henry Cavendish, uh, saw this as well, um, and he didn't quite figure out how it got there. Uh, Anton Lavoisier, on the other hand, um, did more investigations, and he had noticed this too. And, of course, what they noticed was um, the production of uh, a well-known substance. I'll see if I can help here. W. A T E R. Did, did that work? Cavendish and Lavoisier and others continue to experiment with the new air, the new gas that Cavendish uh, well isolated and, and Lavoisier worked with as well. And they find that they can't combust it, um, they can't create this reaction with out the presence of another element, uh, another gas, which we now call oxygen. And every time that they do this, they end up with a product of water. So what we now would call reactants going in, oxygen, hydrogen, reaction takes place, in this case, the one you saw in the video, and we end up with a product of water. And Lavoisier, uh, decides to name um, this new element. Uh, remember, Cavendish initially thought it was phlogiston, the element of fire, but he gave that up and just wasn't sure what it was. And so Lavoisier gave it this name. He called it hydrogen. And he called it hydrogen because it's water generating. And you probably recognize the Greek um, prefix for water, uh, hydro and gen, like genesis or generating. So hydrogen, the name that Lavoisier came up with, makes a lot of sense. It is water generating. So whenever this reaction is done, this, this, this experiment is done, uh, Cavendish repeated it, Lavoisier and other scientists did. Um, despite the great amount of heat, flame, fire created, um, when it's all done, when you fill, when you react oxygen with the hydrogen, you end up with this, with water. And the study of hydrogen uh, to this point, at the end at that point, really leads to two incredibly important changes in our knowledge of chemistry, which really forward the science of chemistry. And the first one was that hydrogen uh, turns out not to be the mysterious element of fire, phlogiston. It cannot produce a uh, fire on its own. It has to be in the presence of another element, so it's not phlogiston. And the whole idea of phlogiston then gets sort of pushed to the side that maybe there is, is no element of fire. And second is about another substance that for a long time, uh, thousands of years, really, uh, people assumed was an element, and that, of course, is water as an element. But if we can make water from an atom of hydrogen, an, uh, one element, and an atom of oxygen, another element, then water is not elemental. Water is not an element. And so those two changes alone really uh, change chemistry. Um, 
Lavoisier went further. Um, he decided to do this reaction and others in a closed vessel. We did it in an open vessel. And if you close this system, if we do this reaction in a closed system, um, everything happens within that container, so to speak. And what Lavoisier did is he very carefully measured how much hydrogen he put in and how much oxygen. And you might think it's difficult to, it is not the easiest thing to measure a gas, but it, it's possible. And Lavoisier was able to do it to the tiniest fraction of a gram. So he's measuring the mass, how much of each goes in, sealing it up, doing the reaction. And you get a, new products, you know, the, the, um, the reactants in this case going into the uh, 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 reaction are hydrogen and oxygen. There's a combustion, an explosion, and we have water on the other end. So what's in there at the end is very different. It has different properties. It looks different. Um, but the mass is exactly the same as, or near, uh, as what went in. There doesn't seem to have been any atoms or any elements destroyed in this process. They've just been somehow rearranged to create this new substance. And this accountability for atoms within reactions becomes known as the law of conservation of mass in a chemical reaction. That, that what goes in uh, this comes out the other side even if it's recombined or reformed in some way, um, it's not lost. This idea gives us, a, a, the law of conservation of mass gives us the ability to account for what happens when substances come together and come apart in a chemical reaction. And it allows us to do theoretical chemistry. It allows us to make predictions we can document our results and share the results of what we did with other scientists, other people. Uh, we use chemical formulas to describe substances. We use chemical equations to describe the entire reaction. But maybe most importantly, it allows us to not just use our imagination, but also knowledge to wonder, you know, what might we do next?